So this is the video for talking about the Russell Saunders term symbols, correct? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the term symbol on the board, and then we can go from there, and then maybe have a question or two. And I'm not really too opposed to working out some things that are similar to the homework. Um, because I'm into having you learn, not just like, you know, putting you under pressure to answer these things. Okay. Right? And what did L equal? Uh, would that be the vector version or the eigenvalue of the vector? That. Vector equation. And what is S equal? <coughs> now this SI is a half, but really it's M sub SI because you're adding up the vector, whether it's up or down. Okay? Right. And then what did J equal? Okay. Now, they all had a magnitude, and the magnitude of L was whatever L, whatever the value of L was, and then was the same thing. And the same thing for J. Yes, sir. So when is J the magnitude of the difference of L plus S as opposed to the sum of L plus S? Ah, so what I didn't really teach you, I mentioned it briefly with a diagram, how you actually add these things together. And I did a two electron version and I did a three electron version, I think. So let's do a two electron version, okay? Let's, let's, um, let's pick an atom which we want to find out what the uh, possible possible Russell Saunders terms are of them. So let's pick, um, is it carbon has 2p2? Yeah. Okay. Let's take carbon. It's got 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So basically, um, what we want to do is we want to find out what are possible terms for this. Okay. So we know that these electrons um, individually, yes? Um, so the Russell Saunders terms for the state of the atom, or are they for a specific electron, or uh, you see what I'm asking? Right. This is a state term. It's for the given state. Okay? It's for the given state. And that state can be characterized by the individual quantum numbers of these electrons. Okay? This is 2p2, right? So we know that for these two, what we'll call, these are called subshells. This is subshell 1, subshell 2, subshell 3. Okay? These are subshells. These are filled subshells. This is a partially filled subshell. It has an N and an L. The two electrons, L of 1, has got to equal 1, right? Because they are uh, P electrons, so their Ls have to be... Their NLs can be minus 1, Plus zero or plus one, minus one, and zero. 
but they're these are they have L equals one, right? Let's see if I get this right. Right. So electron one, they both have L equals one because they're both in the p state. Both these electron one has L equals zero, electron two has L equals zero, electron one has L equals zero, and L two equals zero. But these each have one. Okay. So how do we get L? Okay. Well, L equal L1 plus L2. It can equal L1 minus L2. Or it can equal L1 minus L2 plus 1. That, that's the way the vector sums work. So you can have Russell Sanders term for each orbital state. Say that again? You can have a Russell Saunders term for each orbital shell. Is that right? Uh, no, it's the state of the entire atom. But when you add up these, these always add up to zero. L1 minus L2 is zero, right? Right. And L1 plus L2 is zero. And then here you have zero and zero. So basically your total L is equal to, you know, L1, well, it gets more complicated, but you add them up shell by shell. The, the beauty is, it, is that when you have a filled shell, the L of that is always zero. When you have a, if this was a filled shell, you would also have an, um, an L equals zero total. Okay. All right. Let me, let me make sure I'm getting this right. So, why is the second L not relevant? Sorry? <coughs> but so okay, so each each orbital okay, so each each orbital shell, right, has its own capital L value. Yeah? Uh, it looks like you L. can eat. You can add up a suborbital, a, a subshell, and get an L for the subshell. But what you're after here is the whole atom. And basically, what I'm telling you is that these sums always, for subshells that are filled, sum to zero. So you don't have to account for filled shells when you when okay, you want to learn this term. You don't have to account for filled shells. You only have to account for the unfilled shells. Can I, do you have the notes? These notes? The, the chapter notes. Anybody mm -hmm. have the chapter notes? Sean, did you bring them? I do not, but I can run and grab them real quick. That would be good. The ones you brought with this? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, do you? I think so. I've got the crown of the book in. This might be them. <laughs> uh, no, those are the handwritten ones. Oh, yeah. I don't know what that's what it's like. Yeah, I'll be right back. Okay. okay, thanks. I just don't have a copy of them except on my computer. I just want to make sure that I'm not missing something here. Because this is confusing stuff. I think it was just confusing because you were writing a separate L for each state. Well, but there's one L for the whole atom. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. But you. I should put a subscript here. This would be, you know, some shell N P. But the so like the contribution to the L the from the shell is zero. zero. Okay. Right. This contribution to S and to L yeah. and to J are zero. Okay. Um, so, we're pretty heavily annotated. That's okay. That's fine. Thank you very much.
So basically, this is what we're doing is figure 3.1 right here, okay? And we have basically the situation where L1 and L2 anti-align, that gives L equals zero. That's a vector summation, okay? And then we have the, um, and then we have the condition where L1 and L2 align, okay? And that gives L equals two. And then the other vector sum is this one here, because L is allowed to range in units from the minimum to the maximum in units of one. That's, that's the way the quantum behavior behaves. In other words, there's another, uh, this, is, this is the vector sum. This one you can see geometrically. This one you can see geometrically. This one is a vector sum of the magnitudes, but it, uh, it allows for the quantize, the quantization. So the easiest, the easiest way to figure out what the range of the L's are in, is to get the minimum and the maximum, and then you can have the vector sums in between as well. Does that make, make sense? Because this is vector addition. Okay, were those those three equations that you wrote, L1 minus L2 and L2, right. those are the possible ways to calculate L? Ah, here's the other geom here's the other geometry for this one. Okay. That geometry is L1 So this equals L equals zero. This is L equals two. So you could think of it as they add up together. So you get L1, L2, so that L itself is the both of them because they both equal one. You see what I'm saying? Here you get zero. And then you have L1, L2, and L. And so this configuration you L equals one has a magnitude of one. So how do you know which configuration you're in? You don't. It can these what we're calculating now are the possible states that the atom can be in. What we can do is we can come back later and figure out what what the quantum numbers of the electrons have to be for it to be in those states. Do you see do you see the difference? We're not calculating the state that carbon's in we're calculating the possible states that carbon can be in. All of the possible states. And what I'm saying is that 2p2, with both of them having a magnitude of 1, that there are three possible L states that those two electrons can combine when their angular momentum vector sum. In a quant it's a vector. It's a quantized vector summation. It's not just your normal vector sums. It's quantized vector summation. So that the, the angles between them, there's only allowed angles between them. Either they're anti-parallel, either they're parallel, or they're at some angle here that's set such the magnitude of L is equal to 1. Okay. So you have your L equals 0, your L equal 2, and your L equal 1. Two electrons that have. So what I'm saying then is that there are three possible L terms or L states for neutral carbon. The first one is where they have, they, like this, would be that L equals 2. So that's a D state, right? And 2 is that they are at an angle to each other. That's L equals 1. L equals 1 is a P. And the third one is that they are anti-parallel. That's L equals 0. That's an S. So neutral carbon can have the, be a D, 
a P or an S depending upon the vector summation of those two electrons. Now what we want to do is figure out what's the S. Okay. Well, S follows the same rules. S can be up or S can be down. Okay. So you can have both the spins are up, in which case S equals 1, or you can have both the spins are opposite, in which case S equals 0. The summation of these spins will cancel because this is 1 up, 1 down. 1 up, 1 down. They've all canceled. Now here you've got two that are possibly up, or two that are possibly down, or two that are opposite. If they're both down, that's, that's the same thing as the, the, it's the same thing. The magnitude of S is one. Okay. So, your D here, have D with, this is 2S plus 1, so if S is 0, that's a 1, or you can have a D where but they're aligned, in which case S is 1, 2S plus 1 is 3. The same thing applies for S with these guys, because it's the two same two electrons. They can either be aligned up, aligned down, are aligned opposite. Aligned opposite, capital S is zero. Aligned together, S equals one. Okay, so is this making more sense now, Emma? Yeah. These are the possible states. Okay. So what's J? J equals O plus S. Well, it's the same kind of vector sum here. What do we have? We have L equals 2 with S. Well, let me, can I erase all this stuff? So whenever you have a, um, like a, two, a 2 as a superscript, does that just mean that there's only one electron in that state? If this, is, if this is a half? Yeah. Um, if, if this is a half, then you get a two, right? Yeah. But that could just mean, it doesn't mean you only have one, but it, you could just have one, but it means you have an odd number. Okay. Whenever you see a two there, you know it's an odd number because your S up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, you got a half left over. Whether it's spin down or spin up doesn't matter, capital S is a half. Yes? Um, uh oh. Maybe this gets negated somewhere, but I thought um, conventionally, if you have a, a valence shell um, that's not completely full, the first electrons that go in will all have the same spin direction? Right. Right. Uh, that's for the ground state energy. Ground state. Right. We're calculating all the possible states. We can come back and calculate if you want. We can pick out which one's the ground state by using Hund's rule, which is what you're describing. Okay, so the one where S is zero would be like if one of those, geez, I don't know. <laughs> this would not be a ground state term. Okay. Yeah, these would not be ground state terms because um, you want to maximize, <coughs> you want to maximize S, and then for that S, you want to maximize L. So I believe this is going to end up being the ground state term. It's 3P0? It is a 3P0, that's right. And at maximum S, I'm going to maximize L. But well, we'll get there. Let's get to it. We'll get there when we get there. But, right. So we're not calculating the ground state like you were talking about, Katie. All right, so you want to vector sum 
the L and the S as well. So you've got a situation, let's do um, L equals zero. That's obvious. Uh, that's so easy because now it's J equals S. Okay. So J equals S. Um, so if L equals zero, that's this case. So this is a one and J equals S. S in this case was one. Let me get this right. Hold on. Yeah. This is S equals zero. This because this is two S plus one. So S was zero and L is zero. So is everybody following me? I'm not really saying it very well. Okay. And then S here was equal to one. So J is equal to one in this case. Has so everybody got that? So when L equals zero, it's pretty easy. That's when L doesn't equal zero. All right, we have to add them in the same way now. Let's look at L equals one. We have L equals one and S equals one gives J equals two. Or you have L equals one and S equals one down J Zero. So for L equals one, for this two electron atom, you can have J equals two or J equals zero. <sighs> that means you have a one P two, a three P two, or a one P zero and a three P zero. These are the possible states that carbon can have. So this is a whole lecture in itself. We could we could spend a whole semester on multi-electron atoms and still, uh, you know, there'd be a little bit of fog in your brain. Okay. Shall I do the? So we did this one. That was easy. We just did this one. Shall we do this one now? Okay. Uh, can we get a J equals one out of this? Yes, we can. L equals one. S equals one. J equals one. So we also have. Sorry, I'm running out of room. So why are they all one if if S and L if, if J is S plus L? How can J be one? Well, let me just finish this real quick. Okay, what now? So how is J equal to one if it's S plus L? But oh, because it can equal This one is this situation, this one is this situation, and this one is this situation. Okay, so okay, so you can calculate J's the same way that we capital, uh, calculated capital Yes, it's L. the same kind of vector addition, okay. the quantized vector addition. Okay. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. It just extends up to the, the full quantum numbers of that unfilled subshell. Something happened. Yeah. So the three. Did the I screw up here? Zeros, I yeah, think. zero, one, and two. Thank you. Yeah. This is as much as you can get out of the L equals zero addition. When you have the two electrons anti-parallel, okay. 
when their anger and momentum are anti-parallel and you get L equals zero, you can only have those two possible states. So what about the other one? All right, this is a good example. I'm glad we're going to do this. So I guess I might have a silly question, I guess. Maybe I'm missing something. Okay. So for, for everything we just did, we assumed that S equals 1. All of the vector addition, we all did for the S equals 1. This was all S equals 1? Yeah, we could also do the vector addition for S equals, for S zero. equals 0. Right, which S, that means it just equals L, which would be that one and be that one. Uh, let's see, this is S equals 1. Yeah. So basically, these ones, these ones come about for a certain vector addition when S equals 1, but these same states come out with vector addition when S equals 0, okay. when, the when the electrons are anti-aligned. Okay. Okay. It, it turns out you get those back. So it, that's still the same angular momentum and J and S state, though. So the energy diagram of these are identical. The energy diagram of each one of these is a completely different energy diagram. Okay. But the energy diagram of these are equal, even though one of them's with electrons aligned and the other ones with electrons not aligned. And that may sound weird, but it's but those are energy states. These this basically gives you by by when you once you write down this term, you are writing down uh, the unique state of the energy structure of that atom or ion. And I know it's odd, but these terms give that information. That's why they're so powerful. And then remember that if you have, say, nitrogen something or other, and you find out that you can put that into a 1p1 state, it's going to have a similar spectrum as the carbon does that happens to be in that state. Okay, can we move on to L equals 2 now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's do L equals 2 with S equals 0, then J equals L equals 2 for S equals 0. That's easy. So for S equals 0, we get a uh, 2 and a 2. What happens when S equals 1 and L equals 2? Well, the biggest J you can get is L plus S, right? And that's 3. Okay? You have L minus S, that's 1. You have L minus S plus 1, that's 2, 1, 2, and then you have the maximum here, which is 3. So there's your range between minimum and maximum. And again, if you were to draw this, this is L, well, let me draw it with you. L, S, okay? This is L. S, J, and this is L, S. S equals 1, L equals 2. I know it's kind of weird doing quantized vector addition, isn't it? Okay, so what are we left with? We're left with J can equal 1, 2, or 3. Okay, well, there's 2 already. So now we have 1D1 and 1D3. And we have 3D1 and 3D3. These, ladies and gentlemen, are all the possible energy states 
This one is degenerate with two different vector additions, and these two are degenerate with two vector additions. But the point is, these are all the unique possible states of carbon with the two electrons in the 2p shell. Can you repeat that just one more time? It's all possible. These are all the possible angular momentum, total angular momentum spin states for the atom itself that neutral carbon can have. Okay. Now how do we find the ground state? Well, we know that the filled subshells don't contribute. We want to start by filling the highest angular momentum shell. Right. So there's the Three possible in the P shell. Okay, these are the three nodes in projection of L equals one. The vector length here, the vector length here is L times L plus one H bar. That's the length of that vector. Its projection is one here. Okay. So this would be okay. So when we fill the uh, electrons, we want to put them spin up first, and we want to maximize L. So the first one we're going to do is we're going to put a spin up in, in the plus, plus ML state. Okay. And I'll get back to why we're doing MLs in a minute. So we put this in the ML plus 1 state with MS equals plus a half. Okay. If we just account for that electron, then... Big L is equal to 1, and big S is equal to a half. Now, we want to then put the next maximizing spin, we want to put the next electron in also with plus a half because we want them to align, right? So we're going to put, but we want L to be a maximum. Well, we can't put, if we're going to make the next electron spin up, we can't put it in ML plus 1 because they can't have the same quantum numbers. Poly exclusion. Okay. So we ought to find which one of these that that upstate electron can go in such that when I add these M sub Ls, I still get the maximum. And it turns out it's this one. Okay. So that... What's the maximum M sub L here? Plus 1, plus 0. And the maximum S Okay. Now why am I using those? Because what we've done is we've maximized m sub l, the total projected sum of the m sub l's, and we've maximized m sub s. Okay. By doing so, we've maximized l and s. Okay. Because m sub l can equal minus l to minus l plus 1 to minus l plus 1 plus 1 to, you know, dot, 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 L, okay? 
So basically, to get the maximum L, we need the maximum M sub L. Oh, God, I did that so wrong. I hope you weren't writing that down. Erase that. The maximum M sub L can be minus L to minus L plus 1 dot 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 to L. Okay, so the maximum M sub L is defined by the lark by the L. And we've maximized M sub L, so we've maximized L. Maximize M sub L for that. Yeah, but by maximizing M sub L, we're getting the maximum L. For that workload. For that, yes, for this. For that P shell. For that shell, subshell. Okay. Okay, so that means that L equals 1 and S equals 1. Because the maximum MS is the same thing. Okay, so by maximizing M sub S, you know that S has to be that maximum number. So in that case, We've maximized S by putting them both in the same direction. And we've maximized M sub L by first adding a plus, then by adding a zero, we, that, that gives us still the plus one, that maximum. If we if we'd put this other electron in the minus one, one plus one minus one would have been zero. That's not the maximum possible L. Because if we got M sub L equals zero, then guess what? Our L has to be, has to be zero. That's not the maximum L. Okay. So with L equals 1 and S equals 1, that's going to be one of these P1s. And S equals 1. So if S equals 1, aha, it's got to be one of these. OK. And then I didn't teach you this. So I'm going to teach it to you now. Okay. Wait, so so you How do you figure out what the J is? Yeah. So what you found, you maximize L and S for the P shell. Why didn't you maximize it for the D shell? What D shell? For L equals 2. For L equals 0. Well, the electrons are in this subshell. Okay. And I'm taking their individual okay. quantum okay. numbers and I'm filling that subshell. Don't, don't feel silly that this stuff is totally jumbling the brain. It's going to jumble the brain, you know. But if you really want to understand what you're doing with atoms, this is really good stuff. So we've identified that, in fact, to maximize L, we maximize M sub L. To maximize S, we maximize M sub S. Okay, we came out with L equals 1, S equals 1 as the maximum po of possible L's and S's. Uh, well, for, for S equals up, uh, the maximum, L is the maximum. Okay, so we know now that it's one of these. How do we determine which J state it is? Okay, and I didn't go through this with you. I, sw I skipped it, but I do give the rule. Okay. The description of why this rule works is back there. I've got to find the ground states here. There it is. Equation 4.2 on page 105 gives the rules for how you determine which is the J of the ground state. And it has to come about with the ordering of the energies, and that's in the previous chapter, and it's really hairy stuff. Okay, but if the less, if the subshell is less than half full, J equals L minus S. If the subshell is less than half full, okay, and J equals S. If the subshell is half full, and then J 
equals L plus S if the subshell is greater than half of L. Which case applies here? The first one? Yes, the subshell is less than half full. If it was a three, it would be half full. If it was a four, it would be more than half full. So what we have then is L minus S, which is zero. And ding, 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 ding. We have our ground state term, which is the one that Drew originally had said it was. So the lowest energy configuration, in other words, the one in which the electrons are most bound in the carbon atom is such that the one of the electrons is in the ML plus one MS plus half, and the other electrons in the ML zero MS plus half state. Those two quantum numbers for those two electrons give you that. And I didn't I described it later. What you're doing here by making these two have the same spin up is you're making them be in separate projections of the p orbitals, which means one is going this way, the other one's going that way. They're further apart from each other. Therefore, they interact with each other less, and the energy is more bound. They're more bound to the, to the nucleus because they're not shielding each other. If they're closer together, they shield each other. They're less, they're less bound. It's a higher energy state. You want them more bound. That's the lowest energy state. So the, the 3P, sorry. That's okay. Hold the thought. Sure. Um, so which of these electrons is the ground state of the electron? That's a good question. In other words, I'm not sure that in that sense you can think of there being a single ground state electron. You've kind of pushed me into a gray territory for myself because I've only thought in terms of transitions and what we call active electrons. If a photon came in, it's going to mess with one of these electrons. Which one? I'm not sure. There might be relative different probabilities for that. I believe that this is the more bound electron. Let me think about it for a second. ML equals zero means you probably spend more time near the nucleus. You're more tightly bound because you're feeling the strength of that nucleus closer up. So I think this is probably the, the least bound electron, the ground state electron. Now. I might be wrong, but that's where my reasoning takes me. Okay. So if you were a photon coming in and you were saying, I'm going to make a transition from the ground state to some other state, what you're going to be doing is grabbing one of these electrons and moving it somewhere else. That changes the energy structure. Now it puts the atom in a completely different state, and therefore now its energy structure for transitioning to different energies is completely different. For now, from this point on, when you think about these transitions, these energies, you're talking about the energy of the entire atom, the ensemble of the valence electrons. It's no longer an energy structure that's based upon the Bohr or the Dirac model. These are completely different energy structures. They don't look anything like the good old Bohr energy uh, or Schrodinger or Dirac energy models. They, they have their own flavor to them. And the structure completely changes depending upon what the state of the atom is. That's why we have a, an energy diagram for all the different ones. All right. So then this doesn't make sense in the context of the Schrodinger, Schrodinger model? No, 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 no. It makes, it's, it's all based upon the wave functions, but then you, you just have different Hamiltonians now where the electrons are interacting with each other. And so now where the electrons are in terms of how much time they spend further away from other electrons and how far they're away from the nucleus, that 
gives you a different energy structure. So when you draw the energy structure, it's not going to look like the old, you know, doesn't look like this. It's, it's not this kind of thing anymore. It's more of more like this. Here are the energy structures for the S. Here's the energy structure for the P. Here's the D. Here's the F. Based upon what state that it's in, you see? And then these are split by J values and stuff like that. And so the, now, now it's like, oh, you might go, see, and this might be, this might be a 3S, and this might be a 3P. This might be a 4P. You, you, you know, the, the relationship between these orbitals and these quantum numbers is different now, but the energy structure depends upon these conditions, but the actual quantum numbers of the individual electrons, you know, you could have a 3P to a 3S and have a huge energy difference between that going from a D, 1D1, say, to a 3S1. Well, it'd have to be a 1S0 because of the selection effects. Right, so in the, in the third problem of the homework, you asked us to use Russell Saunders' um, spectroscopic notation to um, to label the transitions in the Schrodinger model. Oh, I did? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that is, I think I meant to say Russell Saunders' model. My apologies for that. If we've already done it, do we have to re? <laughs> well, if it makes sense, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know how you made sense out of that. But you might have made sense out of it by ignoring, not really treating it in terms of Schrodinger. You might have done it in terms of Russell Saunders, but still thought in your mind you were doing. I don't know. But did we get to answer, ask your question? No, anyway? but I just developed like three more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so okay, well so. So the three p zero, you said like that's the ground state. That's the ground state, and so that that describes the, the state as a whole, assuming that it's yeah. The atom has this much angular momentum one, and it has this much spin total, and it has this much j total. Okay. That's the atom based upon where the electrons are doing. Okay, and so so that would that would assume that there are two electrons in the ground state. Well, that's. If you want to talk about the ground state electron, that that was um, it's Patrick, right? Uh, Picard. No, what's your Trevor? Trevor. Sorry, <laughs> I just got confused there. I, I think I was thinking of Patrick Stewart and, and Jean Luc Picard. <laughs> okay, so, never mind. Uh, what were we talking about again? So, um, if you want to talk about a ground state electron, I believe it's the one that is the least bound. Which is the least bound electron? And I argued that it was going to be this one. So if you only had one electron in the ground state rather than two, then that would be a 2p0? What if you, you're saying, what if you had a 2p1? Yeah. Then we'd have to go through all of this again, figure out what all the possible Russell Saunders term states are for what, what's, for, what's before carbon on the nitrogen. periodic table, nitrogen. Oh, yeah, duh. Wait, I thought right. carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Nitrogen's after, so it's yeah. like beryllium. Boron. Boron. Yeah. So this would be boron. We'd have to do this all over again with boron, but it's super simple because it's one electron. Yeah. Okay. So what I've done to you with the N2 thing is I've said, wait, well, before I get there, are there any other questions? Oh, yeah, I do actually have one more. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. okay. So you just mentioned that the transition that you drew would be P D2 to 1S0. Yeah, just for example, I said, I said, let's say we have a photon come in, and the question is, which of these would be possible transitions given the dipole selection rules? So that's that's a good question. Isn't that what you're asking? Um, no? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I guess, so a side question is, I thought it said in the notes that delta J could only change by a maximum of one. 
it did, but I went back and realized that my old handwritten notes, a J can actually change by none. Un and I wrote that email to everybody. Right. But Only if, if J equals zero, it, then it can't do a zero to zero. Same thing for L, right? But and L is the same. Two yeah. is changing to zero. So how, how is that allowed? Oh, well, I, I might have pulled it out wrong. So let, let's do that. Let's, let's, let's do this exercise. This is the ground state. Some photon is going to come in. What are the allowed transitions that this, tra this, this particular neutral carbon can have? Okay. We want to have it obey delta L equals 0 plus or minus 1. But it can't do it from L equals 0 to 0. But that's okay because we're not starting at L equals 0. And we want delta J to equal 0 plus or minus 1, and we want delta S equals 0, and we want pi uh, changes plus to minus or minus to plus. Okay. Now, by the way, what's the parity of neutral carbon? Even. Even. You can only have odd parity if you have an odd number of electrons. If you have even number of electrons, done. It's even parity. Okay. So this is even parity. All right. So if we have delta L equals zero, we can have other P transitions. Delta J can only equal zero if J is not equal to zero. So we're, we have to have Delta J is plus or minus one. In this case, it can only go up. I'm sorry, why? Because you can't have J equals zero go to J prime equals zero. That's not allowed. And J equals zero. Is it? This only applies if J oh. is not equal to zero. Okay. And the same thing with L. You can have a non angular momentum change or non J change. As long as you didn't start or in the state equals j or l equals zero. So we know that it has to change. It can only change by one. So we know that our new j has to equal one. J prime will call it. We know that we have l equals one. So our l prime can equal the same l we are or it can equal one up or one down. One down is zero, or one up is two. Everybody following me? And S prime has to equal S. Okay. So what are the transitions we can have? Three P zero, two. All right. We can go to three P. Hold on. What's the P? Three P one. Or we can do three P zero two. Okay. Um, I think that's the only three P one. Oh. Odd parity. Parity changes. So we can have a transition to this one in an odd parity state. Now, for that to happen, for that parity to change, then the uh, this electron has to go out of the p state into another subshell. You'd, you'd have, it would have to be in two different subshells. Okay. Now, 3P0. I got to go through this in a, uh, in a, okay, we know J has to equal 1. We did that, so this is going to be an S, and this is a 3. So there's another one, and then we have 3P0, 2, we know that J has to equal 1. Now we're going to do L equals 2, and S has to equal 
one and a pair of J's. So those are the, J is always equal to one, S is always equal to two, so J, two S plus one is three, and then we have L equals one, L equals zero, L equals two, and that, ladies and gentlemen, are the three allowed transitions from the ground state for carbon. And what we, we now given those states, we can go back and say, oh, well, what was the configuration? Well, the question is, can you, can you reconstruct quantum numbers? If you want to know what the state of the electrons are, can you reconstruct the quantum numbers that give you those states? Now, the fact that the parity is odd tells you that they're not both in the 2p state. Tells you that one has gone into like a 3s or a 3p or something like that. Everybody good with that? See how we did that? Those. <laughs> well, you know what I love? I love confusion and frustration because if you work hard and sweat, there's this amazing epiphany at the end of the road for you. Some of my favorite struggles in life have been, God, I don't understand this physics, pound my ass on it for six hours on some weekend, and emerge victorious. <laughs> and it's a wonderful situation. What is our question? Yes, continue. So going back to finding S and L, what you did earlier, yeah. so you drew, you drew those vectors for the P shell. I drew what now? For the, you drew the M sub L vectors there? For this, yes. This guy? Yeah. Can you, could you just do that again, but for the, like the D shell? Just like, like so just imagine that there's like electrons so in the D shell instead. When you, like when, you, when you say D shell, you don't mean this, do you? I guess I do, yeah. No, this is not, not these, these electrons are in the 2P okay. shell. Okay. They have like different letters Bye. on them. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're capital, yeah. because it, okay. because we use p for angular momentum of one and s for zero and you know d for two. I know it's weird. This, okay, so the yeah. this notation does not tell you what suborbital or subshell the electrons are actually in. It's the state of the overall atom. Okay. Okay, okay but. Imagine that there were electrons, or maybe this is too, maybe it's, you have to, this is dumb because you'd have to go through a whole other atom, but like if there were electrons. I mean like the homework problem. That, oh, there, there were, <laughs> well, so I'm just trying to understand like what, I guess I'm. It's hard stuff. I'm just telling you. It's in the, okay, so you drew the P-shell and you drew, I guess this is something that we talk about later. This is me being personally confused about this. But you can, you can ask, ask. You don't even know what to ask. Okay, so. I don't even know the question, do you? Right. Gotcha. And I get that. Well, it's just going to be a different L, and it's always going to go from negative negative L to positive L with increments of 1. Yeah. So, so that's a, and the magnitude changes with that square root of L. Yeah. So that's all that changes. You just have a different L. It's so so like L equals change. 2, it's going to go minus 2, it's minus 1, change. 0. So, so let's, do, let's do oxygen, for example. Because we're working with it. Right? This is oxygen? Yep. Okay. So with oxygen, let's not do all of it. We just go for the. I'm just want to calculate the ground state. What's the ground state for oxygen? Well, we fill this one first. We fill this one second. We fill this one third. Now, why did we fill that one third? Because we want to maximize S first. That is our directive. So with three electrons, we now have S equals three halves. That's the maximum you can have with three electrons. But we have now minimized L. Okay. But that's three electrons. The fourth electron, where do we put it? Okay. We have to make it. So the fourth electron, we want to put here is ms minus a half ml equals plus one. Okay. 
So now when we add this minus a half, we end up with S equals two. We took a half off and we end up with L equals one. So we have maximized S up, up, up. And then as we put them in, unfortunately, we're going to start decreasing S. But this gives us, for, as we fill the shell, subshell, this gives us the maximum S. And by going from plus zero minus, we always maximize L for that maximum possible S. But those S electrons. should be one, not two, because we took away a half. This is going to be on YouTube. <laughs> we have minus a half is one. Thank you. Okay, so what's, okay, now is the shell half full, more than half full? Or half empty. <laughs> <laughs> so just real quick. Or if you're a pessimist. <laughs> just real quick, why, did you, why pessimist. did you populate the ML equals plus one first instead of the ML equals zero? Uh, because we want to maximize L for that S. But I thought you said putting in ML equals zero will maximize it first. No, in this, when you put in the second electron, it does because you're not subtracting anything away from it. Right, but whenever you were answering Trevor's question about which electron goes in first, you said that ML equals zero would go in first. No, I, 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 if I did that, I misspoke. ML plus one goes in first. You always go plus one, zero, minus one, all spin up. Then you go plus one, zero, minus one, all spin down in the P shell. You're saying that the ML is equal to one. Yeah. Most, so it goes from the most active electron. <laughs> when is this homework due? <laughs> <laughs> I got news for you, honey. You're late. <laughs> okay, is the shell half full, half full, more than half full, or less than half full? More. Okay, so what is J? Two. Plus S. So what's the Russell Saunders state term? That, if you look on your periodic table, is the ground state state of oxygen. Okay, so here's another question. And it's even because one, two, three, you've got. So if so, this is this is vector setup. It's for the electrons being in the P subshell. Is it different for the S subshell or the D subshell? Well, if you're looking at a heavier element, yes. yes. If you're looking in the D sub shell, you've got O D, right? Ooh, cool. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So this would be plus two, plus one, zero, minus one, minus two, and you would fill them in this order: up, up, up. doing that, you're obeying Hunt's rules. Okay. Now, okay. let's say that's your configuration. Give me your state term. So let's say all the subshells below it are filled, okay, so they all sum to zero, they don't matter. Okay. What's my L? Well, plus two plus one is three, plus zero is plus three. It would be zero. Minus one. Minus two is back to zero, but now I got down electron at plus two, okay. plus one, plus zero. So it's three. What is that? D? No, that's two. Plus two. F? F. What's the spin? Plus a half. Plus a half is one. Three halves. Four halves. Five halves. Four halves. Three halves. Two halves. Two halves is how many halves? Five halves? Lots so that's halves. five plus one. It's <laughs> out of six. Okay, is the shell half full, more than half full? Where is it? More than half full. More than half full. So it's going to be, what was it? Three plus 
five halves. Shoot, six halves plus five halves. I'm not sure I got that right. Wait, the spin? The spin doesn't make sense to me. Because okay. then plus two, the spin cancels, and... Okay, maybe I made calculated wrong. Plus a half. One. Three and halves. halves. Four halves. Five halves. Yeah, it should be four one. Four halves. Three halves. Two halves. So one. But then two. So the, tol the total is So, yeah, so S equals one. Yes. So then two uh, so, so this is three. three. Okay. Okay. And the, the L was... Okay, when you go all the way through here, it's mm. zero, and you come back up here, it's plus two, plus three. It's plus three. Okay, F. So now, it's more than half full, <laughs> so it's one plus three. Okay. Yeah. Better? Yes. Now, what I've done to you in the homework is I said, <laughs> you've got... Get nitrogen two, which I believe has a one s two, two s two, three s two. Is that right? Oh, sorry, I forgot <laughs> something. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Say again. It's exactly the same as what you did for carbon. Yeah. That's carbon. Oh, one S two, two S two, two P two. That's right, nitrogen two, carbon. How fun that we did neutral carbon now. Now we, we actually did the <laughs> yeah. dang it, we did the freaking homework problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. If it makes you feel any better, I still don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but then what I said was, one of the, let one of the electrons go up to the n equals three level. <laughs> So what we're going to have is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, and we could, here are the possibilities. That was lame. It could be a 3s1, it could be a 3p1, or it could be a 3d1. We don't know where it went. Right? Now I'm asking you to calculate the Russell Saunders terms. Oh, I didn't. I didn't say that it followed the dipole transition rules. I just said. Now remember. Yes, if it followed the dipole transition rules, then yes, you couldn't have that one. And if you want to drop that one, I'm okay because what the hell. Okay, it just makes less work. Got that, Ashley? <laughs> I hope you're still watching. Good. Okay. So now, basically, you don't have to worry about these because these null, null out in the sums. What you're left with is this electron and this electron. So you've got a 2p1, 3s1, or you have a 3p1, 3d1. I think I may, these are what are called non-equivalent electrons. Let me go back and see something real quick. I might just say, you know what? We cannot do this one. Okay. How do you do that? Page 81, page 82. That's how you do this. Okay. What are we doing? What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> We're calculating what are the possible are Russell <laughs> Saunders terms okay. for. have electrons in this configuration. Either you, you moved one of these valence electrons up to 3s1 
in which case you have you know, 1s2, 2s2, 3p1, 3s1. You don't have to worry about this stuff because this all sums to zero. You only have to worry about the two electrons that are in unfilled shells, subshells. Okay. Now, you basically have L1 equals 1 and L2 equals 0. And L1 equals 1 and L2 equals 2. Commence with the vector summing. Okay, I've got a table here that shows how you do this. But it's for an NP and prime P. In other words, if you are allowed to have this one, That would be a third possibility. The example I give in the book is this one on page 82. And there's a table. And this uh, shows the whole thing. It's only a page and a half. It shouldn't be hard to figure out. But instead of it being this example, I'm asking you to calculate it for that and that. And you just have to follow these rules that are in this table. But instead of these both equaling 1, which is the example I give, you have L1 and L2 equals 0, follow the recipe, or you have L1 equals 1 and L2 equals 2. You see what I'm saying? But you just follow the recipe that's in here, and you're good to go. What page is that? This is page 81 and page 82. Right here it says non-equivalent electrons. These are what, what are called non-equivalent because they're in different subshells. The this is called equivalent electrons. It's much harder. Okay. I actually did the hard case first. The homework is the easier case because it's a non-equivalent electron. So now you just have to basically follow these addition rules, and you can get out the possible terms. And then you have to say to yourself, are the subshells half full or less than half full? How do I add up the L's and the S's? In this case, they're clearly less than half full. Or do you want to say more than half? What does this look like? Which firing squad wall are we supposed to stand against? That one or that one? <laughs> well, we ended up using an entire class. But this was actually a lecture I wanted to give and decided to skip. Turns out that wasn't a good move. At least not with this one. At least not with the homework assignment. That's right. I was hoping that maybe somehow that magic had occurred and all of this had made some kind of sense. But I think without doing these examples, um, again, go to those vector diagrams if you want to look at how the uh, different things add. But I think if you look at that table, oh, you have a brave soul. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks he did it right. He knows his shit. Okay. So, um, all right, so instead of this being due on Tuesday, let's make it due Thursday. Okay. No, if you still don't like that. I can't no, have... No, that was, was, yes, was a relief. <laughs> oh, it's a relief. Oh, yeah. I, th I thought that was... No! No, that's perfect. Okay, how to do Thursday, okay. um, hand, it in, hand it into my box, okay? I'm going to ask Ophelia to pick up all the homeworks when she leaves at 5. Cause I'm not gonna oh, we don't have class on Thursday, do we? That's correct. Oh. Life got even That's better. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I'm going to have Ophelia pick them up out of the box. So that ha 